Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this webinar this morning on the uh, future for DRT. We've got some really interesting speakers uh, lined up for you this morning, um, and we're going to um, to get them to do their presentations and, and then leave some time for questions and answers later. Um, I'm Catherine Jones. I'm a, a director at uh, Sistra, um, involved in um, the fares and ticketing team. Um, and then we have uh, some representatives of um, those that are actually running DRT, as well as some thoughts from um, Kieran uh, Jasty at the University of um, West England and Richard Jeremy, who's one of my colleagues. Um, so let's get straight on. Um, if I can ask Alice, please, to, um, uh, to come on and give her presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you. My oh, sorry, is... Alice, sorry, before I start. Uh, the most important thing I was supposed to be saying is if you have any questions, please, can you put them into the Q&A, not the chat? If you want to have a chat with with others on the, the um, uh, on the present on the webinar, sorry, you can use the chat line, but we won't be picking up questions from the chat, only from the Q&A. So please put any of your questions in there because we wouldn't want to miss them. Thank you. Apologies, Alice. Okay. No worries. Um, thank you. So my name is Alice Misler and I am the DRT and Community Transport Team Leader at Hertfordshire County Council. Um, so today I'm just going to be giving a very short overview of the DRT services that we operate, how we measure their success um, and our considerations for post-funding um, operations of the services. Uh, next slide, please. So Hertfordshire County Council launched Hearts Links in September 2021 after a successful bid to the DFT's Rural Mobility Fund. The aspirations of the Hearts Links service were and still are to increase access for residents to education, employment, healthcare and leisure activities, as well as reducing social isolation and reliance on single occupancy vehicles. The services operating zone is roughly 150 square miles and covers a very rural landscape. Uh, the service launched with three 16-seat wheelchair accessible minibuses and we're now operating with seven of these. Uh, since September, since 2021, we have completed just over 68 and a half thousand passenger trips, which is a great achievement. And we are still seeing an increased demand for the service month on month too. The HeartSync service in North and East Hertfordshire is operated by a commercial operator and we at HTC manage the service, including customer service, marketing and strategic planning. We operate seven days a week, seven to seven Mondays to Saturdays and 10 to four on Sundays and bank holidays. Um, and with additional funding awarded to HCC via the Bus Service Improvement Plan, also known as BSIP, uh, we were able to make two further expansions to the service in 2023, an evening service, um, which operates every Friday and Saturday evening and a zonal expansion to cover the towns of Hartford and Ware. And next slide, please. So on this side, we can see two maps. The first map shows the spread of our virtual pickup points. We, op we operate uh, point to point rather than door to door. Um, the green pins indicate our free floating stops um, and the purple pins represent our stops within the key hub towns. The difference is passengers can't travel between two purple points basically within the same town um, as the service has been designed to bring passengers from the rural areas into these towns where they can then continue their journey on existing public transport. The second map um, shows the key trends of travel within the operating zone. And here we can really see how our service divine design is actually coming to effect linking people into these towns. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So on here, we've just got some key statistics. Um, so the graph at the bottom of the slide shows our passenger trips per month. Um, so this goes right from when we launched in on the 19th of September 2021 up until uh, present day. And we are expecting to remain at the 4,500 trips per month moving forward. Um, and there's there's a slight undulation in our in our uh, trajectory of, of increase of travel. Um, but that kind of um, aligns with operational issues that we've experienced with fleet downtime um, across the months. Uh, but overall, we're really we're, we're really pleased with with how this is, is grown as a service. The top left graph shows the breakdown of passenger trips per hour of the day. And this has been quite interesting to monitor, actually, um, as we had expected to see some kind of peak travel hours as a trend. Um, but overall, the service has remained fairly consistent um, across the day. 
and the redu slightly reduced levels that you see at the, at the end there just reflect the evening service that we operate. So again, that's slightly uh, reduced hours as a service and actually they're never going to meet the um, other hours of the day throughout our core service. The graph at the top right shows our breakdown of passenger trips per weekday. Um, so Saturdays um, have been and probably will be our busiest day of the week. Um, and Sundays will probably always remain our lowest day of the week, just because um, on a Sunday we only operate till, from 10 till 4. Uh, but we are looking at ways to increase our Sunday patronage as much as possible, um, as well as growing our patronage from the early weekdays as well. Uh, next slide, please. So December last year was a very busy month for us um, at Hertfordshire County Council. Not only did we expand our HeartSynchs um, operating zone um, in, our, in our original service, but we also launched a brand new HeartSynchs service in the west of the county um, with funding from the Bus Service Improvement Plan. The decision was made to operate this service internally um, rather than, than tendering it out to a commercial operator as we could lean on all of the past lessons that we've learned um, over the last three years with the existing service in North and East Hertfordshire. Um, the service operates three uh, of the same 16 seat minibuses um, and slightly reduced operating hours at the weekend, but these will be reviewed in the near future. Uh, it is still in its infancy. However, we have already completed over 4,000 passenger trips um, and the service has been tremendously received by residents in decorum. Next slide, please. So just following on here with the same maps uh, that I showed you for the north and east side of, of Hearts Links, um, I just wanted to show you the layout of our, of our pickup points again. So we're following the same pattern with the green pins showing our free floating pickup points, uh, which essentially just means passengers can travel anywhere within a, the, the green points um, and also our key hub towns um, with the purple points there as well. With this HeartSync service, we launched with an anti-competition feature embedded within the booking algorithm. Um, so this essentially means that if a passenger searches for a trip that could be carried out on existing fixed line services, we won't offer a HeartSync's journey. Um, and this has really helped to limit the number of long distance journeys um, and offer more capacity for residents who don't have access to a high frequency service. Next slide, please. So the last statistics that I wanted to share is just the customer feedback ratings that we have. Um, so you'll see the ones on the left showing the decorum service and the right um, with the North and East Heart service. Um, the yellow bars represent the five star ratings from passengers um, who have completed their passenger trips, completed their trips um, and have chosen to leave feedback. It's important to note that not all passengers choose to rate their journeys. Um, and those who book by the call center will not have the ability to leave feedback. Um, but of course they can email us in um, or call us to let us know um, if they were happy or if they were not happy with their journey. Um, but roughly about 85% of all of our passengers book by the Hearts Links app. So it is, it's a fair representation. Customer service is extremely important for DRT. Um, it's a much more personable mode of transport. And we do receive such incredible feedback about how friendly the drivers are, um, and that the service has been life changing for many residents, um, which is obviously really great to hear. Um, any residents uh, or, or passengers who aren't entirely happy with their experience, um, will reach, we will reach out to them to find out what we could have done better. Um, and we have actually learned a lot of lessons from listening to the feedback from our passengers. Next slide, please. So the question of how do we measure success within a DRT service has been a topic um, of much debate. Um, and there, there are a variety of methods of determining this. Um, of course, we can look at KPIs such as passenger trip numbers, grouping rates of passengers traveling together, uh, vehicle optimization and customer feedback. And these statistics are fairly easy to um, draw down thanks to the DDRT technology that we use. Um, we can and should also measure success by the impacts that DRT have for residents. Um, and looking at how we have contributed to reducing social isolation, um, increased autonomy and independence, as well as general confidence and feeling of safety on board public transport services. The question of measuring cost per passenger as a metric of success is an interesting one. It's not feasible to directly compare the cost per passenger on a fixed line service to the cost per passenger on a DRT service. 
especially within a rural area. DRT services typically operate in areas where density is low and a fixed line service would not be commercially viable. So I think this is where community value really needs to take a key role in how we measure success. Um, of course, I think we all know that DRT is expensive to run, um, but the impact that it's had on our residents um, has been invaluable. We believe that we've achieved the success with HeartSyncs by ensuring that our service design um, was right at the beginning. We knew that over 4,000 residents within the operating zone um, in North and East Hertfordshire had no access to public transport at all um, and relied solely on private car usage or from help from family and friends or taxis. Um, and feedback from these residents um, really signified the want uh, for a bus service. So this was already a key um, area for us to focus this, this service on. We also work closely with our technology providers to ensure that we are monitoring the demands of travel um, and trends of travel to ensure that our operating model remains aligned with the needs of the residents. Um, the service design is not static, so we can and we do make frequent changes to the parameters for our booking algorithms um, and our operational design. And we have also endeavoured to make it clear what DRT can and cannot achieve. So DRT is never going to compete with a fixed line service that transports hundreds of passengers, um, but it does play a key role in providing the first and last mile links um, and helping to remove single occupancy vehicles from the road um, as much as possible. We've also focused massively on branding and marketing. Um, I think awareness is one of the biggest ways to increase patronage. Um, so we always make sure that we have some campaigns lined up running throughout the year as well as local community engagement events um, and roadshows where we're physically out with the bus, handing out leaflets, talking and explaining how DRT works to those who may or may not um, have used it previously. Um, next slide, please. So my last slide focuses on what we're looking to do to keep HeartSyncs going um, in operation post-funding. I think many other local authorities would agree that DRT is incredibly expensive to run and probably will never wash its face. Um, so we know that post-funding, there will be a funding gap. So I'll focus on how we can reduce that gap as much as possible. We are already, already layering our services with home to school transport on a couple of our vehicles, bringing in additional revenue. Also looking to add some additional layering as much as possible with adult care services as well. We've started to absorb fixed route services that have deregistered. Um, so we've taken over two fixed line services in decorum. So again, that will help to reduce the funding gap. Um, and the, the key task is essentially to increase the number of passengers to reduce that cost per passenger. Um, and looking at section 106 developer contributions, looking at ex external synergies with, with companies. We've, we've done that before with uh, the nighttime economies, with our evening service. Um, Rebranding our dialer ride vehicles to align with the HeartSync service and trialing um, hybrid DRT and dialer ride services with aspirations to mutualize the fleet um, in the future to make best use of our assets and also increase revenue generation from fares. And lastly, uh, just rolling out anti competition features into all of our HeartSync operating zones, um, which will allow us to increase our patronage grouping rates and number of passengers being transported per vehicle hour. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alice. Sorry to try to rush you on then. It was a really interesting um, uh, presentation there on, on and, and looks like it's been really successful. Um, can I now introduce Andy Ambrose, who's the Group General and Development Manager for Arrow Taxis, who um, will be our next presenter. Thanks, uh, Andy. Thank you. Um, first slide, please. Um, I'm Andy Ambrose. I'm, uh, we operate the DART services uh, covering the whole of North Essex. We, we go into Suffolk, into South Cambridgeshire and into East Hertfordshire. Um, we've been running since 1985 and started with the Transport Dereg Act of 1985 by um, Shared Ride Taxis, which we then moved into DART DRT. Next slide, please. We run two D DRT services which have gone commercial, um, but we started from a, you know, an entirely different direction to the bus company and council DRTs. 
from the point of view of a taxi operator, never envisaging DRT at bus fares. So our fares are more expensive than a bus. Uh, to give a typical example, um, on our hospital route, we charge eight pounds single, whereas the bus is about five pound. But we pitched our fares on being a third of the cost of a taxi. We received a start grant for the first two years, but then went fully commercial and have been running that particular service now for over 10 years as a commercial DRT. Next slide, please. How do we achieve that? We, as I stated, a fare that resembles the services off, offered. We, are a, we consider ourselves a premium service over a bus. We operate entirely door to door and we try to keep our costs low. Um, the hospital service, which is the one that is fully commercial, it's incredibly difficult to park there. And I think that is the key factor in why that service is successful, because more than 50% of the users are car owners. Um, we did a lot of marketing on it. We managed to achieve growth. We started one seven seat vehicle, managed to achieve growth of 170% on what the previous bus service did in the first year of operation. And all the dark services we run, we had growth up to 500% in the first year on one of them. That service has now gone over to a conventional bus route again, as we just couldn't cope with the demand. Next slide, please. Why couldn't we with the other services? Obviously, the lower passenger volumes, longer distances to travel, uh, protracted market se segments. DRT is, as Alice said, an expensive thing to operate compared to a conventional bus because although you're using smaller vehicles with lower running costs, the seat mile cost is still way out. Next slide, please. DRT in our area is a big solution to a lot of former problems. Um, but most of our DRTs are not commercially viable yet. And with funding support rapidly diminishing, we had to look to other ideas. When COVID came along, it killed our passenger numbers and although we still operated everything all the way through DARP, we diverged a bit and uh, went into the NHS and started undertaking NHS deliveries and food deliveries throughout COVID. Um, that gave us a new idea for the future of DRT and how to try and get the figures to balance. Next slide please. Where did all the customers go? Um, home delivery, that was the biggest factor, massive factor. More than 50% of our customers were lost during COVID home delivery, and a lot of them haven't come back. They're still getting their home deliveries. Um, it, so we thought, you know, what can you do about that? Next slide, please. We decided that the only way we'd get the revenue back was by taking over the parcels deliveries that we lost where we lost the passengers um, and have been considering mixed parcels and passengers as a normal course of DRT service. Next slide, please. Parcels could not necessarily guarantee the sustainability, but certainly help towards it of keeping DRT routes running where the margins are so bad that uh, the councils are saying, you know, we haven't got enough money to keep doing this. The Rem Rural Mobility Fund is coming to an end in a lot of places and a lot of councils, I think it was one in four councils, said they couldn't afford to keep DRT running. However, add parcels into it. In a typical three hour period, we can deliver a hundred parcels we get paid between 75 and three pound a parcel. That's another 75 to 300 pound a day additional revenue from the DRT service. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
what do we need? We need a software that can handle the priorities of both passengers and parcels. We need to adapt the vehicles. And of course, we need to subcontract with one or more of the parcel sources, such as every DHL, Amazon, NHS, local retail outlets. And ideally, we need to aggregate parcels from several companies to provide a smaller delivery zone to allow the DRT vehicle to get around. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. With some of our buses, smaller ones, it's a simple matter of putting a cage across the back, provided you've got the emergency exit still, um, and just putting the parcels in the back of the vehicle when you pick them up from their depot. Next slide, please. And the larger buses, uh, we've been considering roller cages that just push in to where the wheelchair spaces are and increasing the wheelchair space size so that we can accommodate a rack and a wheelchair. Um, but this is getting a little bit sticky with the construction use regulations. We've got to go through them first. Next slide, please. How do we do it? DRT software. Digital input, dynamic input from ticketing systems and the other major operators' parcel systems is the key. When we did this during lockdown, we were doing it all manually and we were doing prescriptions, food supplies to the vulnerable, you know, all together. And because we didn't have the volume of passengers during COVID, that worked out okay. But we really, really need the software to do it and we've been looking at that recently to try and uh, either using APIs from the parcel systems or uh, direct input. Bottom line, uh, legislation is an issue. There are no current rules that prevent you from carrying parcels. However, when you adapt the vehicle, you may be interfering with senior regulations and individual vehicle type approval. You need contractual agreement with the local transport authority, county council. And bottom line is that shared costs increase potential sustainability of the DET by in our calculators at least 25% and we've been up to 50% on some days. Next slide, please. So, one of our views of the future is mixed parcels, DRT. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. And thanks very much for rattling through those slides. That was really, really good to keep on time. Right. Can I now introduce you to Louise Curry, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Lidley Dialeride, to tell us about their services. Thanks very much, Louise. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for inviting me today. So. As I said, my name is Louise Curry. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Lydney Dialeride, and we are a uh, community transport operator, uh, been in existence for over 30 years. Uh, we worked very closely with Gloucestershire County Council um, to have be awarded successfully the Robin service in uh, October 22, when that was launched. And that was really due to the fact that where we are based in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire is that we're very rural and um, we had very little in the view of public transport, certainly across district as well. So it was a case of how we could actually incorporate um, the, the, the demand responsive transport along with uh, the existing services that we actually offered. So if I could just go to the first slide, please. Brilliant. So what you'll actually see here is that um, we had a instant ramping up of uh, the numbers. So we launched, as I said, in October 22, we had two wheelchair accessible minibuses and we operated those 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. six days a week, Monday to Saturday. And um, it was an instant response from the local community. What they decided was that they could make real use of what uh, we were on offer, and it could actually give them the options that they'd never had in the past. And what we've seen is that we've retained the uh, original users, which I always think is a, a really good point. 
And we've also continued to increase our users as we've come through uh, the last 18 months or so. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So actually what you've then seen is obviously in the Forest of Dean, we, um, we, we don't like Mondays because actually that seems to be the, the quietest uh, day of the week. But consistently, we are seeing fairly standard figures uh, running through those. Um, and what we've actually found is it's passengers that didn't take public transport in the in the past. So that was either the fact that they couldn't, there wasn't an option for them to use to get where they needed to go. Um, they didn't want to. Um, they didn't understand the fixed line service or they uh, didn't have um, the right bus stop to where they needed to go at what time they, they need, needed. So we've had an awful lot of feedback which has uh, told us that it's given uh, people options. Um, it's allowed people that have maybe not been comfortable in a public transport setting in the past to actually make use of, uh, of what they're actually offering. Um, and the reason why I felt it was so important was because we've come from a community transport background. We've operated effectively demand responsive transport for a very, very long time. So we are used to building those relationships with the customers. We are used to, um, to making the, the best use of the vehicles that we've got. And I think um, community transport really stands in a strong way of, of actually taking demand responsive transport in um, into the future. The other thing that we've actually seen is we haven't seen a dip in our traditional dial -a ride service. And what we've found is actually that we've increased our dial -a ride passengers because we've been able to direct people to the right service that they've done. And I really believe that as we go forward into the future, this is about an integrated transport system, working out the best form of transport for the passenger at that time. And those needs may change as they go through um, their either their life cycle or their needs and that, that, uh, that can adapt and change. If I can have, and I haven't done a lot of slides on purpose because I do know that you can just be bombarded with information and uh, and you know death by PowerPoint a little bit, but I will end on one slide, which I think actually, if I could just have the final slide, please, uh, was really highlighted by uh, Alice at Hearts Link. Was this is a map of the area that we cover, and we have two A roads that go through our district. Um, the A48 and the A40, otherwise we are literally a, a very rural environment. Um, and this gave the option for cross district. It gave the option to link in with the current public transport provision. And we do have an anti-competition um, algorithm set within our booking system, which means that actually we will not be able to offer a uh, robin transport if there is a public um, transport link already on that uh, on that stop um, so what we found is that people are using us to uh, attend colleges to attend their workplace where they couldn't get beforehand um, they are also uh, utilizing the public bus service and we're we're matching those journeys to uh, the actual public bus services that are operating and also into the local uh, train station as well. So you can see the area that we actually cover. Um, you can see that we're just covering that with two minibuses. So we are regularly achieving just under 900, we're, we're round about the 900 passenger journeys per month now. Um, and I think that we can all safely say that actually to run a fixed bus route system that would cover at every one of these points would just be unachievable. So whilst we can consider that DRT is an expensive option, there is in reality an option to get people out and about, which would never have been able to have done it previously. So people are able to do certainly cross district. We've seen a high level of cross district. We've also seen that they've been given a level of freedom to choose actually their destination and where they want to go, when they want to go. Obviously, the technology has actually helped. So we actually also operate the call centre for, um, for this service as well. And we only take 20% of those calls into the call centre. The rest is made via either the, uh, the website or the app. 
And when we've actually looked at the figures for the app, people are making their decisions in the evenings, working out where they need to go the next day, making sure that they can then make that booking and, um, and move forward. So it's a real level of flexible uh, options that we're, we're giving with DRT and that we can actually then say, right, that's absolutely fine. We can make that happen and um, we can move forward. So I think uh, along with the, the uh, technology that we've seen, we're also seeing a high level of customer service as well. Alice was absolutely right when she mentioned that it is not a traditional bus service. And this is where I think that it feels it sits very, very well with community transport on the grounds that we were used to building relationships with passengers in the past. We were used to understanding their needs and what they required. And DRT is an extension of that. As you are joining um, the, the website, we're asking for your name, your information, all of those details. So we're wanting to build a relationship with you. And that's the service then that they understand that the driver that is coming, they actually know the name of their driver, which I think is really important. And it gives them the confidence that they can actually then track their journey and, um, and all of the information that they have either through the website or the app. Or if they are having difficulties, they can then speak to us in the call center and we can then advise on the best journey that we can actually offer. Going forward, we know that DRT is expensive. However, the social impact is so important because if we weren't in a situation to offer DRT, there is not a fixed line bus route that would take this place. So we have to look at the social awareness and the impact that it gives for people in our local area and the ability to remain independent, to have access to their local communities and actually be part of their local community. So whilst we can look at the monetary value and say, yeah, that's very, very expensive, actually on what we need to do is we need to evaluate the, um, the whole a social aspect of what DRT can actually bring to, to the area. The, the Robin in itself is currently operating in two areas within Gloucestershire. There is a expectation that that will actually be increased. So there is a, a, a great level of buy-in by the local authority that actually they see this as a, um, as a, a, a great way of moving forward with the transport that they offer within the county. So I think what, we're, what I will end on is a very positive note because we're unconscious of time and what we need to do. But I think what we can see is this needs to be part of an integrated transport need, looking at responding to what the local communities require. And then we then look at what we can offer and what suits best, whether that is community transport, traditional armchair to armchair, the, the, the bus stop to bus stop with the DRT, maybe a taxi service or the public bus or the trains. So I think what we need to do is look at actually how we can integrate all of this going forward so that we're looking at a one transport solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. There's a really positive story again. Um, you know, <clears throat> with, with so much uh, doom and gloom about DRT, it is really um, uh, uplifting to to hear some some really some really good success stories. Right, can I now introduce you to Kieran Chatterjee, who's a professor at the University of West of England, um, to tell us a bit more about the findings that they have about rural mobility fund. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Catherine. I mean, it's great great to follow the previous three speakers, and, and including two two schemes um, that have been funded by the Rural Mobility Fund, uh, the Hearts Links and Robin. So the Rural Mobility Fund um, awarded funding to 15 local authority areas in England to trial um, DRT schemes between 2021 and 25. We at the University of the West of England have been commissioned by the Department of Transport to undertake a programme level evaluation of, of the fund. And I'm going to present some interim results up to um, with data based up to September 22. So next slide, please. You have to, after, I'll give a quick overview of our monitoring evaluation work, and then I'll present the headline results from the interim report, which you can see the, um, the cover page on this slide. Next slide, please. 
So the um, monitoring evaluation involves um, process evaluation to start with, which has explored the experience of local authority officers and operators in designing and mobilising the, the pilot schemes. And it's going to follow up and look at their experience in, in implementation and delivery. That's based on in-depth interviews and group round tables. It, it also involves scheme level monitoring, tracking the performance of all the different schemes. Monitoring data has been collected um, before the scheme start operation as baseline data and then continued every six months since then. Uh, the, the baseline date, data was, was possible to be collected beforehand because we're not only collecting data on the um, scheme, the DRT schemes themselves, but also other bus services, other bus services in the pilot areas and also outside the pilot areas. And there's currently a, a, a scoping study being carried out to see what additional data is required for an overall impact evaluation of the um, programme. Next slide, please. The, you can see from this slide where we are um, with regards to monitoring evaluation and the overall timeline. The interim report was published last year and I'll be presenting results from this. There's going to be a final report on process evaluation and monitoring um, completed um, at the end of um, this year. And then there will be an impact evaluation report drawing on further data to follow um, after this. So next slide, please. So I'm now going to present some um, key results from the interim report, um, which covered um, the schemes that had um, started operating by October 2022, which the Robin um, just missed out on that cutoff, but we are monitoring, for example, the Robin um, um, since then. And Heart, Hearts Link was, was one of the schemes which, which is included in, in our results coming up. So next slide, please. Yeah, four, uh, 14 DRT schemes had started in 12 of the local authorities by October 22. Um, another eight schemes have started or are due to start um, since then, included in the other three local authority areas awarded RMF funding. Six of the um, 14 operational schemes at that time were predominantly in rural areas. Um, six were serving areas with mixed urban and rural character and two were serving, were serving suburban areas. Residential populations vary from 12,000 to 176,000 people. The latter being um, North Lincolnshire, which is the whole local authority area where they got the JESCO DRT scheme serving that, that full local authority area. The smallest area served is Mansfield in Nottinghamshire, which is a weekend, specialised weekend evening service. What variation of population density? The lowest is in um, Staffordshire with the Moorlands Connect scheme, and the highest is in um, Buckinghamshire with the High Wycombe Pick Me Up scheme. Uh, next slide, please. There are some common features across the um, different DR schemes funded um, through the RMF and other features that vary across the schemes. All of the schemes are designed as flexible bus services that provide shared transport to users who specify their desired location and time of pickup and drop off. They're all providing a corner to corner service, picking up and uh, dropping off passengers at designated stops. And these are a combination of pre existing physical bus stops and new virtual stops. In some cases, the schemes are restricted to oper operate entirely within a single operating zone, whilst in others are permitted to leave that operating zone and act as feeders to its key locations outside the boundaries. The vehicles being used um, are minibuses with between 12 and 16 vehicles, and the number of schemes per scheme varies between one and six. Journey bookings can be made, made by, both via mobile apps, phone and websites. Fare structures are quite variable from flat rate, mileage based and zone based. The, I'd say the, the schemes have in common the ambition to attract, to attract a wide range of users, perhaps beyond what's traditionally been considered in terms of DRT. So a mixture of age groups and journey purposes. Most cases, the schemes have been introduced with no changes to existing bus services. But some cases, as we've heard, local authorities have taken the opportunity to, to withdraw um, at local authority supported public transport services. Next slide, please. At the time the report was written, the data was available for nine out of 12 local authorities in terms of um, passive, uh, in terms of distant uh, data. This scheme started by October 22. 22. Um, this shows um, 
the trend over three one year period, October 21 to September 22. And it shows distance traveled without passengers is of a similar magnitude to that traveled with passengers by the vehicles. And you can get a sense of the magnitude of the service miles with passengers, which is up to about 10,000 um, miles per month at the highest levels. So the next slide, please. This table here reports on a number of indicators of operational performance in terms of minimum, uh, maximum, average values across the nine schemes for which we had data. Average monthly service distance with passengers has varied from 1,073 to 10,700 miles. The high schemes are seen in the schemes that have been established for longer and are serving larger populations. Uh, the vehicle utilisation rates have varied from between 33 to 86 miles. Um, these are the dist daily distance travelled per vehicle with passengers. Uh, the ratio of distance travelled without passengers to distance travelled with passengers, which we refer to as the empty running ratio, has been in the range of 0.44 to 1.86. Lower values would be preferred, indicating greater utilisation. And the higher empty running ratios have been recorded for schemes in lower population density areas, which means it's likely the vehicles need to travel longer to be able to, to pick up customers. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in terms of um, passenger numbers, um, it's, it's been on, it, it was on, it's on, in the first 18 months, which we're um, covering here, um, DRT usage, as you can see, has been an upward trend or it's or quickly reached a high level and it's been sustained, such as in the case of Hertfordshire, and actually we saw earlier that it has continued to increase. Usage levels of between um, 282 and 1,700 passengers per month have been recorded for schemes that started before October 22. Um, the highest passenger numbers are seen in areas with relatively large populations with more, more vehicles available. Uh, next slide, please. This table reports usage figures in terms of minimum, max, and average again across the schemes, nine schemes where data available. Context it shows the average scheme miles with passengers per day range from 36 to 425. We've got usage levels of between 11 and 67 passengers per day of operation across these, those, these schemes, 38 on average. And the key metric is um, the number of passengers per revenue hour which is showing a range of between 0.14 and 1.77, about one on average. And revenue, revenue hours is calculated as a total number of vehicle hours across all vehicles in the fleet that the schemes have operated each month. This is a similar range of values that's been reported in, in international um, studies of second generation DRT schemes. It would good, be great, of course, to see higher values as um, put the and, and we're hoping to see this as the population served by the DRT schemes through the RMF have become those schemes, the populations are more familiar with those schemes. Uh, next slide, please. The local authorities participating in the RMF are invited to indicate their, their three or more most frequented destinations served by their schemes. We've had a look at this. And we find that rail and bus stations and market towns within the operating zones are are attracting a large number of journeys, but we're also look, seeing healthcare centres, employment and retail parks and schools and colleges. This suggests the DRT schemes are helping to enable connections to local transport, economic, retail, education and healthcare facilities, as was hoped across the um, funding submissions for, for the RMF. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to finish off by some insights from our um, process evaluation. In the, in the experience the local authorities have had in designing and mobilising the schemes, the, the interviews highlighted a number of challenges that challenges that need to become uh, tackled in the setup phase. Um, these include um, determining the um, identifying the, the, the optimum number of vehicles and hours of operation that can be covered within the funds, but without um, data on existing level of demand, that that was tricky. Another key factor was competition law navigating competition law which uh, restricts 
the off, the op operating of subsidised bus services um, um, to where there's a gap in provision. Uh, the report has more on how these um, challenges were overcome. Um, so if you want to look, look further there. Uh, another challenge is whether determining the virtual stop locations, considering issues such as um, vehicle access to the roads and safety for passengers. Challenge involved in the um, complexities of the app development. Uh, one particular issue was incorporating um, payment mechanisms from app providers sometimes not so familiar with the UK um, transport market. Um, and overall challenge is um, the pension in fleet deployment between a um, commercial objective of generating income versus a social objective and providing quality of access can be conflicts there. Um, on, in terms of opportunities, the data analytics have proved highly valuable to, to the local authorities um, in terms of understanding the service usage, but also how that might um, influence wider public transport demand um, in, in, the, in their areas. Um, the local authorities have found the schemes they've had a greater um, um, range of usage, including young, more young people than they might have might have been expected, around around, for example, school times and educational destinations. And um, final opportunities: many many, people, many of the local authorities are seeing DRT in the context of wider policy objectives for public transports, and that needs to think about um, not. Um, I mean, issues have been raised already, being but about car, reducing car usage, reducing uh, carbon emissions, as well as the, the key point that previous speakers have made about providing equitable access to employment and other um, services. And it's it's widely understood by local authorities that this isn't, this isn't going to be commercially viable, viable on its own. It's going to need ongoing revenue support. But if we if we know more about the um, social value of these services has been highlighted by the speakers and I'd like to reiterate that needs to be put into the picture strongly as well and um, yeah we're very interested in the University of the West of England on f finding out more about that social value and watch this space for what we do on on that on that matter going forward so I yeah I'll finish with those those insights and um, yeah welcome the uh, discussion around um, this this topic Thanks very much, uh, Kieran. And obviously that report has got a lot more detail in it um, that uh, presumably everyone can, can read, digest and consider. Right, I'd like to finally um, introduce uh, my colleague, Richard Jeremy, who's um, written some articles about um, the, the challenges of DRT um, and is gonna um, uh, wrap up our speakers uh, uh, with an overview of um, some thoughts on um, the future of DRT. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. I'll just wait for my slide. Hi, yes, I'm Richard Jeremy. I, I'm principal consultant at Systra. Um, next slide, please. So I wrote an article um, with this title, um, um, in January, uh, published in Local Transport Today. And uh, I'd just like to draw together some thoughts from, from what's been said today and, and the article and also um, some new ideas I've uh, had over the last few days about the kind of policy and strategy. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I've, I'm knocking on a bit. I'm 20 years experience in buses and DRT um, and I was uh, was um, my first 10 years and my kind of growing and getting to know buses was in Transport for London in its big growth period in the kind of um, great moderation as financiers call it uh, uh, of the um, there being kind of lots of taxes and um, uh, revenue available during the 2000s and after that I um, went and worked with DFT local authorities and uh, lots of other bodies and um, there's a great beat since 2020 and there's been a great um, much more to play with much more to uh, uh, have a uh, deal with in terms of funding as we all know and and that's been a big change next slide please so 
demand responsive transport and this um, new generation of it has come during this last decade. Um, we've talked about it a lot and it's got some really attractive things for um, people, um, for whole new markets uh, to use. And um, especially the flexible routing, user-driven scheduling, um, new buses um, has has been great, but has depended heavily a lot on financial support. And can that survive um, against the kind of tests of value for money in the long term, especially as we see councils getting challenged um, for on their budgets? Um, the uh, county councils network, as you know, came up with its report with its uh, one in four councils expressing um, concern about the long-term sustainability of it. Next slide, please. So we've dealt with a lot of the things here um, earlier, but a major thing, major thing to be done is leveraging value through the partnership in DFT. And I, I um, something joining with partners like healthcare, education and community transport is something that uh, policy and a practice that is very, I think, very um, worth exploring for rural D DRT in future. Um, community transport services driven by volunteers, um, but they have demonstrated resilience and adaptability. Um, I was working for a local authority um, in the run up to a DRT launch. Uh, few years ago and the um, MP uh, communicated with us and said that she thought that the DRT was fantastic and um, she uh, got loads of praise for it um, and uh, we were wondering what it was but we actually can we actually realized that she was talking about the community transport service and I think that just demonstrated how um, how important that is and how many lessons can be learned through there. And also moving on from that to how we can maybe integrate various transport services. Uh, next slide, please. And um, so there's a, a lot here that's um, increasingly, increasingly um, uh, there for the taking. And um, I'm not a, a AI, um, development expert, but I think there must be some um, opportunities there too. But advancements we were seeing in scheduling algorithms, payment systems um, can facilitate partnerships between small and large scale transport providers. Um, we can integrate operations between different providers and um, we can see maybe how um, I think there is a really big opportunity that Andy um, was talking about earlier with lift sharing um, and collaboration with parcel delivery companies to offer great new innovative solutions. Next slide, please. Um, something that we have to look at, as we've talked about, is funding and how we get some sustainable funding there. Um, for for some for some a few years we can get commercial partnerships with housing developers to provide funding for DRT services um and getting an early integration of DRT into development proposals through se section 106 agreement and um, then providing incentives for residents to use them um is really important and as i said as we've talked about i think that parcel delivery service um uh, opportunity is a really one worth exploring um, as 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 we go forward as in rural areas and semi-rural areas and peri-urban area, uh, peri -urban areas because that's that's a revenue stream that can support DRT. Next slide please. So something that um and I've just talked about is how we can get some data from the pilot schemes um, to inform future decisions and strategies for sustainable DRT. 
Um, I think local engagement and adaptation are crucial. And by continuously adapting to changing mobility needs and technology, I think local authorities can ensure that the long-term viability of DRT is there. Next slide, please. I just wanted to wrap up on a thought um, more widely. Um, and I'm gonna steal a steal a term that's been around a while, um, which is secure Um and uh, that's something that's been talked a lot about in the Treasury and in the US. Um, it's talking about how we provide in government a platform from which to take risks, both for government, for local government and individuals. We need to get some longer term spending allocations for DRT, um, for, well, all sorts of buses in and we need government policy, therefore, to provide predictability um, so others can be innovative. We need local government to be able to take opportunities to be efficient by cross-purposing operation, cross operations, whether that's education um, or whether that's dealing, um, working with the NHS or whether that's um, then going and being able to approach parcel companies with with um with certainty and then we need business to have the security to innovate in a in a new generation of drt that will um do well as andy is doing already mixing parcels with uh, people mixing multiple purposes with people um to enable DRT to be more um, resilient. Um, we need data to be shared with around to do that. And we need um, parcel companies to come on board. Um, that's really what I kind of see as the future, um, secure economics for DRT rural. And, um, I just open up there to questions and discussion. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, sorry, Richard. Richard. <laughs> Is it, um, if I can now ask all of the speakers potentially to come back on screen. Uh, we've had a number of questions come uh, flying into the Q&A. Uh, some of them are a bit of a discussion. Um, so if we, um, I'll, I'll try and pick out those that uh, potentially are, have not been answered and are probably relevant to to everybody, um, as opposed to the, the kind of discussion ones that have gone through and potentially been answered. So the first question that we that was posted came from uh, Roger Sexton. Um, and this was really about um, if a DRT feeds a main route, um, should there be or must there be through fares, decent interchange um, facilities and uh, guaranteed connections? Now, of, Louise, I know that, that you suggested that um, your service is interchange. And I think um, that's the same for um, some of the other uh, services that are provided. So in terms of 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 providing that completely integrated through journey um, uh, experience, how have you managed to make the most of what you can offer? Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I think what we would be looking for is the the information when that person is booking. So there is a um, a section where they can put that they are um, arriving by train um, or that they are uh, looking to connect to a bus. Um, and I'm, I'm, I won't say that it's perfect at the moment, but it's certainly our intentions to make sure that uh, we either communicate with them uh, regarding um, timing issues that we may have with that or that, uh, that we're well on the way. So I think it's a level of customer service. And I think that's where DRT comes into its own um, because we've got a contact number and we've got a name for that passenger, uh, which differs on the public bus services. Um, we are lucky actually to be based where we are. We're actually based in a bus station. Um, so 
so it's it's a good point of contact to then go on through to the public bus services. Um, so yes, I completely agree with him. I, th I think that actually what we would want is we want that that connection. That's what makes DRT viable for more people to get further to where they want to go. So I think definitely work in progress, but we're we're making headway towards that. The next question, Andy, I think is, is probably one that, that you'll be answer. Have you had any complaints or pushback from taxi operators? And this obviously is, is something that, that um, all three of your operating DRT services potentially have um, had to uh, consider, but clearly, Andy, it's very close to your heart. Um, <laughs> a quick answer to that is no. And partially the answer is no, because we own most of our local taxi companies. So, but and? there is a, me? sorry. Alice, I just wanted to bring you in there. Um, have you, have you noticed any, any concerns from local taxi services for stealing their passengers? No, no, not really. It was a small, it was a small concern that we had pre-launch, um, but we've not had any any pushback. Okay. Um, there's been quite a few discussions about the times that DRT run. So why are they mostly during the day? Uh, and there have been some comments back about why that might be. Um, but if I can open that question to you all, what what is the, what clearly, Evening services are on fixed line. Um, traditional transport are much more limited. Surely DRT could fill the gap there. Um, I, I, if I just uh, come in first, what we actually notice is that we actually drop off our requests during the evening. So whilst the thought process may be that people want an evening service, actually the the most availability we've got is probably um probably in the late afternoon um whether there would be a opportunity to expand into the later evening service i really don't know but i think um alice you already offer something along those lines yeah we do we do uh evening service from 8 to eleven thirty every friday and saturday um and if and when we get any more funding i'm sure we would probably look to do that across the week but it is it is funding dependent for us how successful has that been, Alice? Really, um, it, the, the uptake on it was uh, very quick um, and we've had it, you know, people using it to get home from slightly later shifts if they're not working the typical nine to five, um, people using it to access nighttime economies. Uh, we did some partnership working with a local um, pub providing a, a semi a shuttle service for them um, to try and encourage residents to go to the pub that's in a, in a village um, and not accessible by anything other than private car. Um, yeah, and overall, yeah, it's been it, it's been uh, really really popular. Um, and hopefully, like I said, if we did get more funding, we'd be able to expand that further. That that's one of the um, that, that's one of the advantages of, of having a um, program, the Rural Mobility Fund, and multiple schemes um, such as Alice has been mentioning. There are variations in the operating hours and, and including weekend operation quite a lot of them are operating at weekends so the, the, the variation in in operating times we, we we'll hopefully be able to learn quite a lot from all those different um different operating regimes and find out what what works best in different circumstances if i can jump in here um we run to eight o'clock in the evening on all our council contracted services but with our hospital services, we run right late into the night. But we cover them with taxis at DRT fares. And our thinking is, well, we're losing money doing that. The point is, it gives us much more customer satisfaction and they're likely to use us more during the day as well. So in that case, Andy, are you actually running the uh, service from the, the kind of hospital locations? directly to people's homes without lift sharing at all? Um, sometimes it can just be a single passenger, yeah. But our average utilisation per vehicle per hour 
um, differs quite substantially from the rural mobility funding figures. Um, our average is about four or five passengers per hour. So quite often they're sharing. And are you finding that, the, that those are people using the hospitals or hospital workers who are needing to get home? It's a combination of both. Um, I think we only have one regular hospital worker late at night, but um, the visiting hours at our hospital finish 8.15, which is our last regular service. But, you know, we've got a sort of policy of not to leave people stranded. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the other questions uh, that, again, I think is, is probably applicable to all of the services we've heard about today, has the absorption of any fixed line services seen previous passengers transfer? So where you've been running um, uh, alongside um, fixed line services, have passengers transferred? And I think you probably all said that actually you don't do that. You have the um, algorithm to prevent that. Um, has that made a difference to the way that the services can integrate? I don't mind coming in on that one because we have two different operating models. Um, so the North and East Hart, um, Hearts Links doesn't currently have the anti-competition within it, uh, whereas the one that we've just launched into Quorum does. Um, uh, but uh, we are planning on uh, rolling that out to the existing Hearts Links um, at the end of April. Um, we, we have, when we first launched, we didn't really know what the trends of travel were going to be. I think it's because there wasn't really um, a similar example to what we were trying to achieve that we could kind of look to, to ask what they've done and, and what they've experienced. Um, so we were kind of in the dark almost about what to expect. So we didn't want to limit the provision too much um, because we didn't want to end up not, you know, having any uptake to the service. Um, but in hindsight, had we known that the demand was going to be there pretty much from day one um, and the anti-competition feature was there we probably would have implemented it from day one um, but where we do see some longer journeys taking place that probably could be done on existing public transport um, we, we're hoping that when we implement the anti-competition those will those will stop um, but in but in the west it's, it's not possible because it's blocked by their feature yes yeah, certainly for us uh, here in the forest of dean we've always had anti-competition um, so we've um, we've not absorbed any of the fixed line routes, but actually what we've done is been able to uh, bring people in so that they can then uh, come over and, and, and catch the public bus services that they need. So what we've seen is that people are uh, having much more option that they are able to go from a, a bus stop nearer to their home. And that way, then they can then um, access the rest of the, uh, the transport services within the area. And Kieran, is this something that you potentially will be um, looking at when you're doing the review of how the um, the, the 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 various services funded by um, the Rural Fund have have operated and the yeah. different impacts they have? Yeah, we're looking at the impacts on um, other services that, that are running in in the areas and on the edge edge of the areas, um, looking to get a picture whether DRT abstracts from other services or whether it might even. Um, increase overall uh, usage it might might um might even in invigorate more usage on other services yeah i think it relates to the point the, the first question that you raised about some integration with other bus services i'd say ac looking across um, the, the whole fund most of the so most of the drt services are not really very very well um integrated in terms of ticketing particularly particularly in terms of ticketing um, and it, there are a number of barriers to that. To to that at present, DRT are not are a new a new model for for b bus operation. They're not they're not, for example, the the bus op the new the bus operating data service that's been set up doesn't include virtual stops at present. That there's work going on to to build those into the system. So they're not they're not they're not, they're not um they can't easily be integrated into wider bus services. That's just one technical barrier at, at the moment. So the, there are examples of, of the of the in the RMF. Nottinghamshire does have um, in, integration between its other bus service, and that's because Nottinghamshire, I, I believe, are in a position where they have um, 
they are also um, have um, I think they may be well themselves be the operator or um, of other bus services in the area. So they have um, joint operation of DRT and other bus services and are, are able to um, um, in, set things up in that way. And Richard, you know, you've talked about um, how to um, potentially, you know, make uh, DRT sustainable. Um, what's your thoughts on kind of the the importance of integration? I think, I think that it's very. I think it's really important. I think that there's a lot. I I appreciate that a lot of people can't um, have bank cards um, or can't have sort of the sort of visa cards um but i i think that you know just being able to um use your visa or your in fact your for some people phone pay um systems are are really as much as you need for or well no not as much as you need but that's that's good and how much we put into making excellent um, in terms of integration of payment. That's something that um, may cause a kind of a challenge for DRT. But I think, I think ideally, ideally, and um, we should be able to get kind of regional or sub-regional integration of ticketing systems. And now I think fares are, are um, being able to get a sort of a standardised fare system is something that is probably um, might be problematic. Um, Andy talked about how how his you know fares for his services uh, are aimed to be larger than um, bus fares, and I think being able to sort of integrate a Fares into a um I hate using mobility as a service as a kind of thing because it's such a cliche, but um being able to get um demand response of transport into a kind of mobility as a service thing is is a is a goal. Um I think it's I think we shouldn't let what we can do now um with simply being able to use our um our cards and our our um smartphone pay systems and um, to to be able to travel and book system that leads into one of the questions that came up um what are the drt operators experience and balance of using apps versus call centers you've all um suggested that the app is proving very popular as a way of booking app or website but do how are you finding the that across the the demographic of your users so um certainly for us we find that it is the older population that prefer to use the call center um and that actually may be that they just don't have the technology in place so they don't have a smartphone or they don't have a computer that they have access to um so certainly th those are the types of phone calls that we're we're taking and so you very quickly get to build a relationship with them because they're phoning for regular journeys or they're they're making a similar journey whenever they actually book but actually the majority of ours are, are covered by the website or the or the app which we we have um, which they have access to and we find that very often those um, bookings are made outside of the working day so it does give them a flexibility to look at the transport needs that they have coming up over the the next few days and they can book it at their own convenience um so i think it will always need a combination of of those ways of booking but predominantly the the WAP, uh, the website and the app will actually uh, will dominate the, the the bookings in the future. Alex, were you going to come in there? Uh, yeah, so I think for us, we noticed a decline in bookings via the call center as the service matured. Um, so now we operate about three point five percent of our bookings come through the call center. About four point five come through our booking website, and the rest are through the app. Um, with our West HeartSync service that launched. Only a few months ago, um, we've got 16% of our bookings being made by the call centre. Mm -hmm. um, and that typically is where people aren't confident on how the app works, perhaps. 
um, or just want to ask a few general questions, which then will convert into the making a booking with us there and then, um, as well as uh, Louise saying, you know, with people who just don't have access to technology or want to just pick up the phone and call. Um, so we do, we do see um, that decline in the, in the usage over time. So we're expecting that to be the same for our new hearts links as well. Can I just come, yeah. can I just come in there? Hundred percent of our bookings are through the call centre. We just don't have an app. And have you had anyone, Andy, say, "Do you have an app? Could I book this through the app?" Or is it just a recognising because they're used to calling uh, the same number for a, a taxi previously? Yeah, we we do. Um, mostly these calls come from our county council, so you should have an app. And we say, yeah, if you pay for it, we'll be like to have one. <laughs> but is there is there a danger that that you know moving more more towards apps or you know um, uh, mass services as as uh, Richard mentioned, uh, you know, is, is there a danger there that that those that, that are are unable to access the that technology are in danger of being um, less able to to access a service which is probably one of the services that provides them with uh the independence that makes a difference to their lives so the you know the balance there of, of, of offering them a service that that really can be life-changing for them but through a uh, a system that they find uh difficult to negotiate I don't... So if oh, sorry sorry go on I was going to say for us, um, so we've we've tried to encourage people who can um, learn how to use either the website or the app. Uh, we've provided user guides. We have um, done in engagement events where um, somebody will go, say, to a retirement village um, and hold a morning where they will teach people, whether it's on an iPad or a laptop, how they could book and manage their bookings themselves. Um but for us, we will always keep a call center um, because, you know, it's it's a service that is inclusive of everybody to use. And to remove that call center option would almost discriminate from residents who don't have access to technology. Um, so for us, we will always keep that in place. I think I would actually agree with Alice as well in the fact that um, it, it, you have to have a range of ways to actually make that booking. Um, obviously, as generations, we become more tech savvy and we move into uh, different different age groups, then we may actually find that the call center does continue to drop off, but currently at this time, and uh, I, I would want to keep some level of uh, call center that we've actually got uh, a point of contact that if they are struggling, even to actually load the app or load the website, we can actually talk them through that and then they can go on and, as Alice said, then make bookings um, with the freedom of the other technology that they have available. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with both of these and Alice, we've got to have apps available and it's obviously a direction in which we've got to move. And the only reason we haven't is because historically our market segment is the elderly. Uh, and they like just to phone up sometimes and have a chat. It's you know. But I think it I think it would be um, helpful to have some research on non-users as well as I mean, correct to have more research on the users themselves, um, their experiences, what they're using the, the services for, how, how it's beneficial to them, but also non-users. And there, there may still be even with this, which looks looks very promising um, results. We're seeing, for example, in Forest Dean, Hertfordshire. And we've had for a long time um, in Essex from Andy's um, work. Um, it'd be useful to know from non-users who are who are not sort of engaging with these services um, what might tip the balance for them and achieve potentially more um, positive social inclusion results. Yeah, I think yeah. Be, that would be really, really interesting research, Kieran, if if that was able to get to be undertaken. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> go on, Richard. Oh, um, yeah, just. Going back to the the call center, I think I think that is something that will be will be needed. Um, I just I you know I I cannot imagine a time when my mum will actually start to use apps with any kind of thing and just like out of a sort of part of principle she will not. So a call centers I think will be needed for 
for for a demographic i, I think maybe certainly for businesses that are for drts that are are funded then that's there where we need to um look at um authorities um, combining their call centers um it doesn't it you know a call center can operate for a drt service from um you know from anywhere i'm not i'm not saying that call centers go off to another country but the call centers can be combined um with regions or just company uh authorities that want to um spin out so that might help reduce costs of call centers as we go forward thank you uh, there's been quite a lot of questions and um about um what what passes are valid on the services are all the NCTS passes valid on all of your services or is there a variety there? Certainly for, for us, we, we um, accept the concessionary bus passes. So, uh, so yeah, we don't, um, we don't have a limit on, on what passes can be used. So, uh, and actually I think that's a really great way of people using DRT and, and understanding that they can have this service and that they can actually use their concessionary bus pass as well. Nice. That that that's a local authority um decision rather than part of the national reimbursement scheme though. So it's a it, great and it's good to see that the, the yeah most local authorities in the RMF are doing that, but but it's something local authorities are having to foot. Yeah, we we accept um concessionary passes um anything that falls into the in. Um, TCS, CTS um, scheme. We also have a saver card discount in Hertfordshire. Um, so any uh, child aged between 11 and 25, I hope I got that right, colleagues, um, it can purchase a, a saver card um, and then they get 50% off travel. But as we're under the £2 fare cap um, for our services, um, our saver card reimburse um, discount is £1.50 because the pre £2 fare cap price would have been three pounds reduced from my 50 so it's not quite 50 percent, but it is um still a discount Andy? yeah we accept ENTCS on all our services um i'm not trying to have a pop at alice here please don't get take this the wrong way apart from those that originate in east hertfordshire because they don't pay a ct ENTCS because they say we're, we're a drt service I think that's, you know, uh, again, uh, Kieran, that would be really interesting to look at the the impact of that potentially across the, the services, if there are some that, that choose not to, um, given that the, you know, those those um, passengers with the NCTS passes are probably the ones that that are less likely to to drive. Yeah, I think, I think across the, um, the Rural Mobility Fund, so far, the results suggest 70% full, full fare paying passengers so that the although it's that's an ruin, it's hugely, hugely important, but it's also very positive that we're seeing um such a large percentage of um full pair paying passengers. Okay, I'm just trying just trying to choose some some of the questions that are that are perhaps a little different from the others. Um, um the <laughs> There's a, a, a suggestion here from somebody that um, where there are virtual bus stops, um, would a cheap and easy way of identifying them, would uh, could that be to paint the word bus on the roads at the pickup location? This is using Guernsey um, and with it, result, it results in not needing um, any kind of, you know, flag or pole uh, indication. Um, I know, Louise, Alice, you both said you used virtual um, pickup points. Um, how how have you found the experience of people understanding where those pickup points are? Uh, so actually, we um, the majority of ours, and I will say that it, it is the vast majority of our already existing bus stops. They may have been taken out of use because the commercial uh, route has been withdrawn many years ago, but they are. Um, standard bus stops uh, that right. we've actually used. So, um, so yeah. So what we're doing is utilising the existing bus stop network 
it was was already in place. Um, yes, I, I know Guernsey and, and understand the process that, that they do. And, and, you know, that would be a welcomed um, point to actually uh, put that as a highlight, really. Alice? So when we um, first launched, we looked at all of the Naptan bus stops um, in the area um, and similar to um, the Robin, we used as many existing um, bus stops with infrastructure as possible to make it a focus point, people knew where to go. Um, but as time went on and we had more and more demand, a lot more of our stops became true virtual bus stops with no significant infrastructure. Um, so we had to go through a whole renaming process of all of our stops. Um, rather than using what the existing bus stop name was, we had to go by the village or the town that it's in, the road name and some kind of identifiable feature. Um, because if you're using the app, the app will tell you exactly where to walk and where to wait, which is great. But if you've made a booking via the phone um, or the website and you don't have that app to track where you're going, we need to be able to identify exactly where you need to wait. So near a war memorial, for example, um, or if there's a, a specific shop um, but we don't mark these stops because they are so changeable. Um, we're adding new stops all the time. Um, and sometimes we have to pause stops or uh, remove stops if they become unsafe. So um, because of the dynamic nature of virtual pickup points, having some kind of signifying feature at all of them isn't really financially um, viable, to be honest. And did you, does your service use virtual bus stops? at all or are you much more of a outside no. your house service yeah we're mostly door to door um but we do have passengers gather together at certain points which hasn't been the thing we set or set up they just do that the bus will pull up and eight or nine of them from the local housing estate will be standing on the corner Obviously, that chat before they get the bus. Um, I was involved with in setting up some of the uh, flexi services in Wales, um, the, the, and those in the um, urban areas. It was a lot more difficult to identify which um, which street corner that street corner was. Um, so that yeah, you're right, Alice. You, those using the app found it uh, much more um, simple because they they were directed to exactly where the bus stop was. Um, but those that are booked either through the app or the call centre were then, there they was initially, especially at the start, um, a lot of phone calls back to the call centre to say, I'm standing on the corner and the bus hasn't turned up and it's the wrong corner. Mm. Um, so it is something I think, you know, that technology is, is incredibly helpful there. But again, it's, you know, those that can't access that technology are the ones that are, you know, in, in, in danger of being disadvantaged because they've missed the bus because they weren't where they should have been. And again, Kieran, I don't know whether you're you're looking at any of that in the research that you're doing. Um, yeah, we're probably not going into that because we're looking across um, multiple schemes, right? It's around 20 or so now. now um, we're not digging in so closely into the level of detail. But that level of detail, unfortunately, but it's, uh, it seems very important. Uh, I'm very conscious of time. Um, there's lots of questions we haven't been able to answer. Um, uh, Juliana, I don't know whether those questions will be retained at all um, and whether there's uh, any any way that they can be answered um, offline at all. Um, but yeah, I am conscious that we are we are very close to the end of the um, of the event. Um, and I'd like to thank all of the uh, the speakers um, today for what's been a really fascinating, fascinating insight into some really positive um, uh, examples of um, of DRT schemes that have been different from each other, but I think some of the success factors that um, that you, you've all talked about, you know, is that that kind of um, the customer service, really understanding your customers, but being able to offer them connections that um, are very different to some of the the, the uh, traditional public transport. You talked about cross county, um, and that those maps were really insightful. Seeing where the, the kind of the, the journeys went, where there, there would not have been any opportunity for uh, those connections. I think my um, uh, the, the takeaway that I have from this session is really, uh, and again, this is something, Kieran, that, that you know, I don't know whether you or somebody like Passenger Focus might be able to do some work on, is how do we um, measure the, um, the social benefits that are coming from these mm -hmm. services? You know, they are expensive to fund, 
um, but they they provide a lifeline for for some of our uh, the the more vulnerable people in our in our society. And you know, I don't know how we measure that. It's been a conundrum in in my thirty years in in the transport industry. It's always been that conundrum. So um, something to think about in terms of of, of keeping that funding going. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for all the participants. Um, and as, as Juliana has pointed out, there will be recordings available um, very shortly. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.